Yeah. Mr. Hobbs, it's me on the intercom. Go ahead. Yeah, I think someone sent you a Christmas gram. Dad! <laughs> all right, uh, let's get it over with. I walked all day and night to find you. You look like you came from the North Pole. That's exactly where I came from. Santa must have called you. Oh, yeah, sure. He uh, just got off the cell phone with me. He did? So, go on. Go on with what? Well, I, are you going to sing a song or something, or can I just go back to work? A song? Uh, yeah. Anything for you, Dad. Uh, I, I, I'm... I'm here with my dad, and we never met, and he wants me to sing him a song. <laughs> and um, I was adopted, but you didn't know I was born. So I'm here now. I found you, Daddy. And guess what? I love you. I love you. I love you. Oh. Wow. That was weird. <laughs> Usually you guys just, uh, you know put my name in the jingle bells or something it's me your son susan wells had me and and she didn't tell you and and and, and but now i'm here it's me buddy susan wells you, you said susan wells yes who sent this christmas gram what's a christmas gram i want one i think we should call security good idea i like to whisper too <laughs> It's okay, Walter's my father. Well, your dad's busy right now. Okay, I'll come back later. Yeah, you know, you're not gonna come back for a while, okay? You're gonna go back to Santa Land. Okay. Yeah, why don't you go back to Gimbals? Imagine receiving a singing telegram like that. We want to talk this morning about a group of individuals who received the ultimate singing telegram. They were at work, and all of a sudden, they were confronted with this unbelievable news, and it was given to them in really an unbelievable way. Now, you've probably heard this story hundreds of times. Even if you've not spent a lot of time in church, you're probably generally familiar with it. But here's my goal today. I want to see this story differently. I want to learn something new, and I also want to see if we can be encouraged in some way to change because we all need to find hope. We're in a series called Hope for the Holidays and someone pointed this out to me last week and it was a great, a great observation. I want to talk about this for one second. We have this hope on the back wall here and we realize that for some people the word hope might not mean what the Bible means when the Bible says hope. Do you know what I'm saying? Like we do things with words and sometimes lo uh, words lose their, their power. Think of how people use the word love, for example. They say, oh, I love my wife. I love the Cincinnati Bengals. <laughs> I love pizza. It's like, okay, that's the same word for three different, very different things. Or they say, oh, it's awesome. Oh, you know, that video game is awesome. God is awesome. It's like, hmm. And hope kind of is one of those things too. Hope is a word that we see in the Bible all the time. But a lot of times when we use the word hope, we use it quite differently. People say, well, I hope my team wins this week. If you're a Lions fan, that's what we say all the time. <laughs> or you say, oh, I, I hope it doesn't rain for the picnic. Or I hope I get a good grade. But really when you say hope like that, what you're saying is, I wish that it won't rain. I wish my team will win. I wish that I get a good grade. Hope is actually something far more significant in terms of the Bible. Here's a good biblical definition for hope. Hope, according to the Bible, is the certain belief in a preferred future. A certain belief in a preferred future. Not a wish, but a true hope and I believe that that kind of hope can bring peace even in difficult circumstances. So let's look at our story to see how we can understand this better. Chapter 2, verse 8. Look at your Bibles with me. It says, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. 
And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with, what does your Bible say? Fear. Fear. Now there's a couple things to understand here. These are angels that are appearing to somebody visually. Now let me tell you something. Sometimes it seems hard to believe, but angels play a very important part in the Bible. They're mentioned almost 300 times in the Bible. In the New Testament, angels appear to people 18 separate times. Now you might wonder, well, why don't they appear anymore? Well, number one, who says they don't? In the book of Hebrews, it says, be careful because you might be entertaining angels without realizing it. You don't know. I actually have a story. I won't go into it. But I believe that when I was younger, I actually encountered an angel. I'll tell you that story later. But here's what's interesting. Angels in the Bible are almost exclusively used to bring a message. And that might, that might be the reason why angels don't appear as much. Because the completed message of God is in our hands. Okay, this is the message. And the word angel, or in the Greek, angelos, actually means messenger. So look what the messenger says in verse 10. And the angel said to them, fear not. Now here's what's funny. Almost half of the times when angels appear to people, that's the first thing they say. Why? Because angels would scare you to death if you saw one. Think about that. You're out there in the field, minding your own business, and suddenly, boom, this light shines. You see something in the sky. I mean, it would be scary. Like, almost like an alien encounter. That's what I think of. Now, angels are spirit beings. But in the Bible, they appear to people in different ways. Sometimes in the form of a human, but sometimes they appear like almost like sci-fi. Uh, if you want to write this down, go check out Ezekiel chapter 1 for an unbelievable description of angels with six wings, multiple heads, and all kinds of stuff. Okay, so the point is, these guys are out there, and these angels show up, and they're scared to death. And the angel says, fear not. There's a lot to be afraid here. As a matter of fact... When Jesus was resurrected, an angel appeared to the guards, and the Bible says the guard fell over, and he fainted. It says his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow. So it's important for them to say, fear not. And in the first century, that was an important thing, because in the first century, it was a difficult time to live. Remember, the Jews were subject to the Romans. They were overtaxed. The Romans were building stadiums. They were fighting wars. They were building fortresses and ports. And the culture was very divided and there was a lot of angst. As a matter of fact, it's similar to what's going on today. There was, there's a big cultural divide uh, and tensions are high. And so I think in this chaotic time, you recognize that the angels bring this message of comfort to these very common shepherds. And they say, fear not. I think some people here and some people watching online need to hear that same exact message. Fear not. Fear not. Why? Because if you're a believer in Jesus, you have hope. Not a wish, but hope. The certain belief in a preferred future. Remember this, for those of you that are feeling overwhelmed right now in our culture, for those of you who feel like it's almost impossible to have conversations with people where families are divided, remember this, fear not because you have hope. Now, why does this messenger feel that he has even the right to comfort his audience? Well, let's look at the rest of what he says. Verse 10, he says, Fear not, for behold, I bring you... What's your Bible say? I bring you... I bring you... Thank you. Good news. When you have good news, you get excited about it. Am I right? He says, I bring you good news. If you're taking notes, write this down. The story of Jesus is good news. The story of Jesus is good news. The word that's used here in Luke is evangelizomai. Kind of sounds like the word evangelist or evangelism. Sometimes that word is translated in the Bible as the gospel. The gospel. That, become, that comes from sort of old English where it was actually good spell. 
So good news and the spell, that's usually like a story. So that's why we get the word gospel. But here's what I want you to know. This is not just good news like you and I might think of good news. Like, have you ever had somebody tell you, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news? <laughs> ever heard that? Reminds me of the pastor who said, I've got some good news and some bad news. The good news is that everything we need for the offering for the rest of the year, we have. And the audience clapped and they said, the bad news is it's still in your bank accounts. <laughs> the good news and the bad news. This is not just good news. The messenger is saying this. I have the answer to the problem. I have not just good news, but good news. Not just good news, but great news. There's good news, and then there's the gospel. There's news, and then there's the kind of news that would cause angels to show up in the sky. Do you catch what I'm saying? This is a big deal. This is earth-shattering. This is life-changing news. And you'll notice that there's an immediate impact to this good news, and that is great joy. Look what he says. I bring you good news of a great joy. If you're taking notes, here's the second thing you can jot down. The story of Jesus creates great joy. They go together. Good news. Great joy. Kind of like peanut butter and jelly. Peas and carrots. Batman and Robin. Han and Chewbacca. The lions and losing. I'm going to work that in there. Okay, enough, enough football. Let me tell you something. It's an important part of the message they have because for the last 400 years, biblically, there has been no news at all. 400 years, sort of a celestial silence. The book of Malachi, the prophetic book of Malachi was written and then for 400 years, nothing. No messages from angels, no messages from God, nothing. And all of a sudden, this angel breaks through, this messenger breaks through, and he says, don't be afraid, I've got good news, I've got really good news of great joy, and here's a new one, look what he says at the end of verse 10, for all people, for all people, jot this down, the story of Jesus is for everybody. Matter of fact, say that with me, would you? The story of Jesus is for everybody. Now, to you and me, that might not seem that strange. You think, of course, the story of Jesus is for everybody. But for the Jews and for those shepherds that day, that probably sounded pretty strange. Because up until this time, the story of the Old Testament was salvation that was focused on Israel. Think about it. The exodus of Israel from Egypt. Uh, the entry into the promised land. The exile out of Jerusalem. Then the return to Jerusalem. But Jesus changed everything. That's why the news is so good. That's why the news brings great joy. Because the story of Jesus is for you. The story of Jesus is for you. And you. And you. And you, and you, and me. Do you understand that? The story of Jesus is for everybody. And then we go to verse 11. And this is really the content of this good news and great joy. He says in verse 11, look at your Bibles. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, that's Bethlehem, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Unto you born this day is a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Then he says how you're going to know that this is true. Here's the sign it says. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying. And do me a favor. Let's put this up on the screen. I want to read this together. Just like the chorus of angels did that day. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, 
peace among those with whom he is pleased. Now that was pretty good, but what I want you to do is pretend that you're in a Christmas play. How many of you have ever been in a Christmas play? I remember one time I wanted to be in a Christmas play. Of course, I wanted to be one of the main characters like Joseph or maybe one of the wise men or something. I got assigned to be one of the angels, which I thought was not very fun because there was a bunch of them. But what I learned is that angels have a fun role because we got to shout these words. And I want to do that again. And I want you to pretend that I just cast you in the role as some of the angels in the sky. I want you to find your motivation. (laughs) And realize that you are bringing news that will change the universe. Literally, this is the turning point in history. Do you understand how big this is? Let's read it together, angels. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. That was a lot better. Although (laughs) somebody over here should start drinking decaf. This is big news. And when those shepherds heard that message... Nothing would ever be the same for them again. As a matter of fact, the rest of the world would change. And right after that, the Bible says the angels just disappeared as fast as they had, as fast as they had shown up. And I'm sure the shepherds just they sat there stunned. Did you see that? Did you see that? Did you hear that? Did you see that? And what do they do? Well, they just went back to work and forgot about it. No, of course they didn't do that. They had to go tell somebody. They had to go see for themselves. So what do they do? They went to Bethlehem and they started telling everybody what? The good news. They were the very first evangelists. They were the very first ones to move out and say, you gotta, you, I got to tell you what I saw. I got to tell you what's happening. This is big. This is bigger than big. And here's the biggest takeaway for us today. Their lives were changed when they heard the message and went to meet the Savior. They took the next step and became messengers and told others. Let me ask you this. Have you heard the message of Jesus? And have you met Jesus? I'm assuming many of you have. Well, what's the next step? You got to tell others. You got to share that message with others. It's not just good news. It's unbelievable, life changing, earth shattering news. You got to tell other people. Now you say, Phil, I can't do that. I'm not qualified to share the good news, the gospel with everybody else. Well, um, let me just remind you these were shepherds. And apologies to any shepherds here in the audience. But that was not a job reserved for geniuses or theological wizards. They were very regular people. And they had an experience worth sharing just like you. Remember this. Jesus is for everybody. Sometimes we forget that. Jesus is for everybody. Sometimes I think in our culture we think, well, Jesus is for good people. Sometimes in our culture, I think uh, Jesus is for the people that I agree with. Jesus is for the people that I like. Jesus is for the people, you know, on my side of the political fence. You don't feel like sharing. Sometimes, I don't know if you're like this, but sometimes when people get a hold of a good thing, for some reason, they want to keep it to themselves. Right? Like your favorite little restaurant that you found that has this great food and it's like a secret and you're like, I don't want to tell everybody about it because it's going to ruin it. Or maybe like your favorite band or something. You just love this band. It's like, I don't want everybody to know about it. Then it won't be special. It's only special because it belongs to me. Well, let me tell you something. Not only is Jesus for everybody, but there's enough of his love and forgiveness to go around the world like a million times. As a matter of fact, are you ready for this? I believe the more you share his good news with others, the more great joy you will feel. 
You say, well, I, what would I, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. Okay, it's simple. Like the shepherds, just tell your story. What have you seen God do? What has God done in your life? What changes have you undergone because you have a relationship with Jesus? How has forgiveness made a difference in your life? And by the way, you don't have to paint it out like it's all perfect. We know once you follow Jesus, he comes in, he forgives you of your sin, he sets you on a path. But the road to sanctification takes a little while. We're going to trip up. We're going to mess up. That's okay. You don't have to keep that out of your story. That's real. What you can share share is this great joy that you feel and the hope that you have. Remember? The certain belief in a preferred future. Not a wish. Not a dream. But real hope. And it's up to all of us to do that. Remember what Peter said, one of Jesus' disciples. He said, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the what? Hope that you have. So here's my challenge to you, all right? I want you to close your eyes just for a moment because I want you to do some, some brain work here. Here's my challenge. I want you to think of one person in December that you can share hope with. I want you to think of one person that needs to hear good news. I'm asking that God would just pop that name into your head. Maybe it is a coworker, and you know that he or she is just going through something just so difficult and you know that they could use real hope. Maybe it's a classmate. Maybe it's a teacher or professor, maybe a coach, maybe a brother or a sister or a neighbor. God's putting one name. You can see it kind of in your mind's eye, like it's in neon. Christmas, by the way, you can open your eyes, is a perfect conversation opener. It's a perfect conversation opener, right? Think about this. Jesus Christ, it's right in the name of the holiday. C-H-R-I-S-T, Christmas. Someone was telling this morning... I think every time we write the word Christmas, we should, we should capitalize the name of Christ. Because we'll tend to forget that that's the whole point. You can't spell Christmas without Jesus. The good news who creates joy, not just for me and you, but for everybody. And by the way, maybe you're like absolutely petrified to share the good news with somebody. Well, then invite them to church. Invite them on Christmas Eve, like I said. Almost everybody will go to church on Christmas Eve. Last thing, if you need prayer, if you need some help, if you need someone to talk with, or if you'd like to learn more about what it means to follow Jesus, this is our text help number. You can text that number. It goes to the pastors on staff. We'll reach back and reach out back to you and have a conversation if you need prayer, if you need some guidance or some help. Let's pray.